What's up, everyone? Welcome to my corner of the internet. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is Crossover Commerce, presented by Ping Pong Payments, the leading global payments provider helping sellers keep more of their hard-earned money. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Crossover Commerce. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is my corner of the internet where I bring the best and brightest in the Amazon and e-commerce space. What does that mean for you guys if you're listening for the first time? Uh, well, that's a great question. This has helped to educate people in the space, whether it be an entrepreneur who's entered Amazon or e-commerce for the first time recently, or they're just looking to apply different knowledge uh, to their business and, and grow it in that capacity. We talk everything from marketing and advertising to listings to product ideation, uh, all the way to international growth and expansion, which is what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get started, let me take a quick breath. This episode is presented by Ping Pong Payments. That's right. Episode 213 on Crossover Commerce, as always, presented by Ping Pong Payments, helping international sellers keep more of their hard-earned money what does that mean for you? Well, if you're sending funds internationally, remit remittances to your supplier, um, whether it be in China, which again, happy Chinese New Year to everyone yesterday, uh, and or if you're um, sending and paying for uh, services, whether it be with a VA or any sort of international expense, pay them in localized currency, and you can do that easily with ping pong payments. It saves on fees, it saves on time, and people and entities get their money quicker. Receiving it also very easy to do as well if you're on different Amazon marketplaces or different marketplaces in general. As your brand grows, let Ping Pong grow with you as a growth partner. Go ahead to usa.pingpongx.com forward slash podcast for more information and to catch all of our past episodes of Crossover Commerce. It's easy to sign up for free. And then also it's free to catch all these episodes um, all past 212 before today. Um, and just catch past episodes to apply to your business and, and to see who's been on the show before. So, um, But for people who are new to the show, this is a live podcast. So if you're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter, thank you for spending some time a little bit out of your day. Uh, for some parts of the country, it's blizzard season. Other parts, it might be uh, raining like it is right now, turning over to snow. Or if you're around the world watching or listening to this, we appreciate you turning in no matter what time of day. But if you have questions for myself or our guests, Feel free to submit those in the comment section below. We'll throw them up on the screen that you're watching on, and we'll answer the questions as best we can. Um, if you don't catch the live stream, no problem whatsoever. You can listen on your favorite podcast destinations, or you can just reach out and just tag our guests. We'll make sure you get your answers question and learn how you can get in touch with them. That being said, let's jump into today's episode. We talked a little bit about international sourcing logistics uh, in the Gateway to Year, but let's talk about just a brand in general. Moving internationally, what that revenue opportunity looks like. We kind of alluded to it yesterday, if you were listening, uh, more of the gateway to different marketplaces, specifically Europe yesterday, but let's just talk brands as an international play here. It might be on Amazon, but a lot of people are talking about what's that next step? What's that look like in terms of where my brand and products might go next? And that is through obviously the topic of international expansion expansion, excuse me. So we are going to call today's episode how to understand and scale your brand's international revenue potential. And that is going to be talked about with our friends over at Momenta. We have David Vanderjat. Uh, he is the global growth, uh, excuse me, senior director of global growth over at Momenta, which is a soft software platform, a SaaS platform. Let's call it what it is. Um, helping people scale their brands internationally. And without further ado, I've gotten a tutorial. I've gotten to walk through it um, from David, and I thought that was so interesting to kind of get his insights on the matter. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and bring David Vanderjet of Momenta over on and welcome him to Crossover Commerce. David, thanks so much. for Absolutely. Happy to be here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I don't have a translator like you were talking about what earlier this week uh, in Portuguese or in Spanish, but hey, one on one, it, it might be uh, a little bit easier in this regard. So we're Absolutely. glad to have you on. So uh, a little, little inside joke there for people. Uh, David had to do what three webinars you were talking about the other day, all consecutively yeah. in the same one in different languages being translated. Is that correct? Translated real time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and so like I while I'm talking, I can I can hear the translator. It was uh, 
it was it was an interesting experience but but hopefully uh hopefully helpful to some holy smoke i can't imagine i'm trying to think of a podcast being translated simultaneously right now which again might be useful for uh our audiences and friends out there i know we have listeners in ireland which obviously is not a translation to english much um if at all and we have people in india we have all over the world listeners but uh that, that's really cool that you guys actually put thought and focus into into that does that mean obviously that focus is on international for you guys like i guess going into that and segue into what who is momenta and who you are uh, yeah is that a big focus for you guys yeah absolutely um in in the context of that those particular webinars uh they, they were actually some uh, groups uh that were pr primarily latin america based um the, so they were interested in in launching U.S. marketplaces. So most of these are brands that started uh, within LATAM, grew within their locality, their their country, uh, may potentially even have a marketplace presence within their uh, home country. But they're looking to get into the U.S. Obviously, with with uh, the U.S., you know, China, some other players making up a large chunk of at least marketplace opportunity for brands. Um, there's there's interest in obviously we talk with a lot of brands. And some of our, I would say most of our client base are actually U.S. based brands that are looking to expand outside of North America. But there's actually also a growing interest um, internationally of brands that are looking to enter the U.S. or the North American market as well. So we from a Momenta standpoint, um, we help with both. Um, so Momenta is what we call a custom global marketplace integration uh, SaaS platform. And so what that really means is. That Momenta helps brands um, scale with integrations into over 260 marketplaces um, with over uh, 75 pre-connected warehouses. So think like 3PL warehouse type partners uh, across 70, 70 countries. Um, so we work with brands that generally fall into two buckets. Um, one would be mid-market brands that uh, have aspirations to be global, but don't yet have any global infrastructure. And then we also work with large uh, multinational brands that have grown through acquisitions and already have a global presence that consists of all these what we call global uh, disparate technology infrastructures, right? So they've got things going on all over the world, but nothing that kind of tightens it all up, pulls it all together and allows you to, to see and, and manage what's happening from a global marketplace perspective. But uh, from our lane, really, the end goal is the same for both uh, types of types of companies. We're going to help establish an official store and a branded experience within that marketplace. And then our software becomes the connective tissue for managing their catalog, inventory, pricing, order, shipping, and messaging data at scale. Holy smoke. I mean, you're, you're talking about something that, that can tap into a lot of people just talk about one marketplace. Let's, let's just be honest. And that's Amazon. But to scale... First of all, you said 270, 270 marketplaces? Over 260, yep. At this point. Okay, so... so Call it 260. That that is ginormous in terms of the amount of marketplaces. What is what is a quantifiable marketplace? Like what is the definition? I want to make sure we're on the same pace. Place. What is the definition of marketplace? Is it a certain capacity level of which transactions are happening or of which a third party can come in? What what is that definition to you? Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. There's probably several definitions there. Um you know, at, at a high level, uh, a definition would be any marketplace that offers an API or some type of integration connection, which helps you, again, not only report uh, what's what's happening for your products or your brand on that marketplace, uh, but also allows you that opportunity to manage your, your product listings, your catalog, orders, inventory levels, pricing, uh, customer service, you know, messaging. So that takes on different forms, especially if you start to get into the uh, 3P versus kind of 1P uh, type type options out there. there. There are many platforms like the one obviously most well known is Amazon's platform, your vendor central, your seller central, right? Your 1P or your 3P. Um, when you get into other marketplaces, those lines get a little bit more blurred. Um, even, even within the US, if you look at a, a Wayfair or maybe an Overstock in terms of how they it's it's it sort of leans more of like a 1P model, um, but there are nuances of it that also kind of would would fall under 3P, if you will, for Amazon. So it differs a little bit everywhere. So I would say broadly speaking, um, you know, the definition would be: is there an uh, an integration point that allows you some level of control over what's happening with your products or your brand um, in that marketplace? And then also, um, what, what type of reporting are you looking to see and, and how can you aggregate all that reporting and roll it all up into a single view? Holy smoke. I mean, well, and that, that makes sense, right? There, there's a lot of opportunity in that regards as well. Maybe like the basic functionality of 
why Memento needed to exist? Like, what was that core? Was there a gap in that market where there was nothing connecting to as many as, you know, maybe it was connecting to 100 marketplaces or not worry about the smaller ones? I, I can imagine at a certain juncture, if I'm a listener, like, oh, 260, that's a lot, but are all of those worth my time to even consider? Yeah. Like, is that kind of the gap of which Memento is filling right now? Yeah, yeah, I think so. The, you know, the, the, the reality is, is, you know, while in North America, we know the large marketplaces and obviously there's category specific marketplaces out there as well. Um, you know, if you get into maybe like a house or, you know, a Home Depot.com, even kind of opening up as a, a, increasingly open up, opening up as more of a marketplace. Um, but um, there, there are also, um, you know, other other marketplaces that have that may be the largest within their respective countries. So look at uh, Flipkart and Amazon. Uh, look at a Rakuten in in Japan. And so while we recognize Amazon as kind of being the juggernaut and, and maybe Walmart being sort of a fast fast follower from a marketplace size and opportunity standpoint um, here in the U.S., that doesn't necessarily apply uh, country to country. And so you know, Memento was sort of born out of that need of, well, how do you, how do you not only start to look at expansion options, revenue potential, uh, where, where our brand should go next, how do you take control of that customer experience and that branded experience across those marketplaces, especially if you have some level of global distribution where product is getting diverted to resellers that are then listing that product within a marketplace within a country, how do you start to take back control of, of that, um, that brand image, you know, that, that brand equity that you have, uh, out there with your products. Um, but then also I would say, you know, just the, the, the scalability or the difficulty thereof, of, of being able to manage, uh, all marketplaces, like how would you do that? Right. Say you have 50 marketplaces, um, your man, are you going into each of them individually and uploading, you know, content, uh, fixing content, changing pricing, uploading new products, run, changing your advertising campaign. You know what I mean? Some of that is still um, limited in terms of what you can do through Memento, specifically on the more the promotional advertising front. Um, but when it comes to just managing catalog, managing content, managing copy, managing uh, pricing, uh, being able to look at inventory levels and positions within marketplaces, um, it's, it's at that point, leveraging a software solution like, like a Memento um, can be very, very helpful from an efficiency standpoint because the size and effort that it would take to manage all of these individually uh, can be a pretty, pretty immense undertaking. Assuming that they're, you know, that these marketplaces do offer sufficient opportunity to the brand. Right, and, and I guess everyone's question is always going to be, when is the right time? A, AKA, when, when do I know that I'm ready for more than just one? Right, of one one is manageable i think as an individual but as you scale your time gets dedicated into different resources different you know functionalities even yesterday we were just kind of just chatting through obviously different marketplaces in europe but if you look at a whole whole perspective there's the opportunity of oh europe is 700 million people i think we were talking about um clearly much bigger than the united states but each individual entity almost like a state by state if you're in the united states um those are completely different. So if I'm in an Amazon and, or if I'm working on, not just on Amazon, but like a CD discount or which is in France or even talking international, like a Mercado Libre or uh, in, South, in Latinx or, or Latin America and um, Rakuten, which again, all these different ones, Coupe in South Korea, all these ones that are super um, popular in their own locale, but I don't know where to start. Like, I, I think I have a good product where, where am I fitting into each of those uh, marketplaces efficiently and effectively and not just let's try it here. Okay. That's not working. Let's try another one. And then I go through a list of 260 and then I'm going bananas. You know what I mean? <laughs> like where, where do I start? What's, what's a good, I guess I'm looking for what's a good way to get that next step and, and take it to an efficient and effective way. Of course. Well, there's, there's definitely a few different ways to look at this. I mean, one would be, uh, where, where does your product exist already, right? So you can do that with some basic searches. Go out to that individual marketplace, search your brand name, you know, search your product, maybe search for some competitors and just understand what's happening in that marketplace already. Are there uh, are your competitors there? Are they putting effort into it? Are there substitutes or sort of complementary products to yours that are, are already being sold there? Can you get a sense for maybe how, how, how successful they are or 
uh, how, how much effort's been put into those product listings, how deep they go. Um, potentially there's, and we could talk a little bit about this more as well, but there's, there are some tools out there. Some of the things that I'm sure this audience is very uh, well versed in things like uh, helium 10 jungle scout, um, et cetera, met many others out there that'll help give you estimates, uh, for certain marketplaces, specifically, you know, Amazon and Walmart, um, mm -hmm. and, and probably others as well, but the big ones. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, there's kind of, there's different ways of, of sort of evaluating them. A lot of times what we see uh, our brands doing, is, and, and again, this this varies a little bit depending on, you know, the size of the company, how long they've been around, what their distribution looks like. Do they have a global mar uh, presence regardless of e-commerce, but maybe brick and mortar distribution? Uh, what are those countries that have some level of established uh, brick and mortar sales already? Um, that may be worth uh, considering, especially if you can get insight to, uh, to those retail partners or maybe that distribution or wholesale partner within that country. Um, you know, just just knowing what you're exporting uh, to that to that country can be obviously indicative of what the demand is and the interest in your brand. Um, but there are some other like more tactical things you can do as well. So looking at maybe Google Analytics, Google Trends, looking at your social media following, right, and then starting to segment. Uh, by country where those where those followers are right all of these can be like little indicators um, or triggers for for saying you know this is there's 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 some level of demand here right and uh and it's probably worth exploring so going out to that marketplace doing those searches understanding what's happening where you can't uh potentially estimate uh revenue potential or sales unit sell through um, there are other things that you can look at like um uh you know how, how many reviews exist out there Again, how, how built out are the product listings? Um, you know, how, 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 where are they falling in terms of non-branded search specifically for your products? Are they up at, the, up at the top of the page? Does it appear that some reseller of some type is, is, uh, is getting some traction uh, with selling those products? So again, you know, ho hopefully that's helpful. Lots of different ways to look at this, um, but, but there's, uh, you know, it starts kind of with the research sort of auditing, you know, your, your brand, your product, within these marketplaces and starting to kind of measure up an opportunity for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, I, I think for a lot of that, it feels like in this, and this is like a, a more of a feel thing uh, of a lot of people are taking a really hard look at it. I think it was queued up in 2019 going to 2020, I think because of timing of what was happening in the world, a lot of people were looking to take that next step, maybe got delayed for one reason or another, obviously do you, to maybe maybe the global pandemic maybe now they encountered a lot of in 2021 the supply chain issues but now it feels like if if you've kind of gotten all through that and you're still you're still having kicking you're still doing uh growth and you're you're looking at all right what's now the next opportunity maybe they're opening up that that playbook if you will what what has changed in those last couple of years I, i'm curious from a perspective because i know you've not been with Mimit that long but as a company standpoint, you've been in the space quite a while. What what is that that change into where we are now? That opportunity. What what does exist right now? Because back then it existed, but where is that maybe it evolved and shifted into nowadays? Does yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, so so our recommendation obviously is this. You know, timing is always right. At least to be examining and, and keeping an eye on what what opportunities exist out of, outside of your home locality. But in the past couple of years, with with COVID, with supply chain disruptions, like you've said, sort of general market instability, you know, uh, inflation, just different things happening. Right. Uh, our recommendation, what we see from our client base, um, is that a, a lot of a lot of groups are looking at this as as a play on more distribution channels, kind of helping to uh, kind of with risk mitigation and, and alleviating some of those other sort of macroeconomic headwinds. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you're not being proactive about global marketplaces, chances are somebody else is. And, and I alluded to this uh, earlier a little bit with some of the, the reseller risk, who's taking who's maybe re, uh, taking your product, diverting it from other distribution channels. Um, the reality is that in a vacuum, you know, in a market of like white space where there's no product that exists, but there is a, a, a market of demand, a consumer demand um, for that particular product, people are going to find something to sell, right? Whether it's your product, whether it's a competitor product. Um, and if it's your product, then, then you as the brand have all the liability, all the risk uh, position in terms of your brand equity, your brand image, uh, how your products are being perceived based on how they're represented by that reseller whether they're authorized or unauthorized within that marketplace. 
um, or potentially, you know, even counterfeit um, is, 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 is obviously a big risk. And we hear a lot about, you know, counterfeit and bad actors um, in the news, uh, specifically here with Amazon. It just seems to come up most often. But of course, that applies anywhere uh, in other marketplaces as well. So, you know, our stance is always going to be like, wh why not, you know, be, be proactive about it, right? Um, whether, whether, there's, whether there's, there's nothing happening with your brand in that particular marketplace or there's something already happening, uh, regardless, it's better to be proactive about it. So, so sizing up the opportunity, understanding, you know, from a cost structure, how do we get products in? How do we deploy inventory? How do I um, really, you know, measure my landed cost uh, to get product into this particular marketplace? What can I sell it at? You know, what is the what does the market kind of dictate in terms of uh, of, of pricing and everything? Um, all of those things are obviously important to consider, but. You know, generally speaking, once you've achieved some level of traction, maturity, and that obviously is going to vary brand to brand, but once you've kind of hit that level within your own home country and your own, let's call it your own home marketplaces, um, you know, after that, it's it's start it's time to start looking. Like, don't don't ignore uh, international, don't ignore global. Um, if you spent the time and invested the time to to stand up your brand right within your own home locality, you know, and assume that. You know, especially as the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, from a from a from an e-commerce perspective, um, don't don't assume that just because I've ignored a different country, you know, that there's not a subset of maybe expats that live in that country that that know or appreciate or are a, a, a buyer, um, a shopper loyal to your brand, and so thinking about those marketplaces and how quickly you can move into them and uh, how you can get some of even maybe your core products set up there. And uh, just to understand what what that opportunity looks like, what sell through looks like, um, what that what that audience um, looks like, and how they purchase your products. I mean, all of those are things that that can only offer upside in the long term. Do people get overwhelmed by the amount of opportunity? I think out there is, is that like a is that a fear of of brands or sellers when they come to you guys and say, "Listen, I I don't even know where." To, like it's that shock of. Even when selling on their first product, people can get an, uh, paralysis by analysis of, mm -hmm. yeah, there's this opportunity, or maybe, maybe this will be. There's no product in this market, so maybe uh, my sales will even skyrocket. But is that in in nature and fear of which you guys have to overcome and help people just start? Is that a <clears throat> is that a problem that you guys have to encounter a lot? Of course, I and mean, that's the most common question that we get. You know, is I, I know I know global is important. I know marketplaces are where the, the bulk of e-commerce is being done on a global level. Um, where do I start, right? Like where where do I first look, and how do I measure that? And there's so many things that go into it, um, obviously. But uh, one thing just to kind of call out in terms of how you may consider, you know, with with all of the marketplaces out there, right? Where do you get started? Um, where do you have inventory today? Getting inventory into a country is probably one of the the single you know most uh, largest initial hurdles. Um, and what options do you have to deploy inventory in that country? So, if uh, playing that forward a little bit, if you have an inventory position, whether it's a brand owned warehouse, whether it's maybe a retailer, a wholesaler, some type of distribution partner, um, oftentimes that's that's going to help you get beyond the kind of start from scratch in that country. You know, some countries have regulations around setting up business entities or legal entities um, to even be able to sell there. And that can be quite a process in and of itself. But if you have a partner, like I said earlier, distributor, wholesaler, retailer, you know, something of that nature that that's already purchasing products from you. So you have an inventory position there, um, perhaps, you know, working with that partner to help fulfill inventory for the marketplace that you're looking at launching, considering launching, or you've determined to launch it, um, is, is a great place to start. So one of the first things we often, you know, look at, or we ask about, uh, when we're, when we're talking with new brands is where do you have inventory positions, whether they're owned by you or not, uh, throughout the world. And let's start to put a, let's start, start with those countries because chances are, there's a reason you have an inventory position. There's some type of demand, there's some type of, uh, of an audience, um, or, or sort of target, you know, addressable market for your products there. Let's start there. And then let's like start to look at what marketplaces exist in that country, maybe how those marketplaces are positioned. You know, some of them are obviously focused on general merchandise, kind of the Amazons of the world, but some of them are a little bit more narrowly focused on certain product categories. 
Um, but if you have product that exists, you know, getting product listed and then sold into uh, the end consumer through that marketplace is often a very advantageous place to be. So um, if you don't know where to go and you do have some type of global footprint, let's call it, um, that's often oftentimes your best bet, you know, from 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 uh, from a speed to to launch in that marketplace perspective. Um, if you have nothing. So basically, let's say I'm a brand I've been selling you know, through my website, maybe I've got a little bit of brick and mortar, whatever that means to you. Potentially, I'm, I'm on Amazon, maybe maybe one or two other marketplaces um, in, in, in your in your home country or in the US. Where, where do you look outside of that? I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but looking at, um, you know, social media followers, looking at uh, where you're getting traffic to your website, um, look, doing some research in terms of competitor or similar products out there, understanding if you can be cost competitive within that marketplace. Those are all great, great places to start. I mean, certainly from from our side, we can uh, provide a list um, depending on the category of your product of marketplaces where we see the most traction for those types of products. And we see kind of uh, uh, countries and marketplaces that that have a pr propensity to buy products like yours at a, some, at a, at a fair price point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's often white space and it can often be a little bit, you know, paralyzing in terms of, well, where do we go? You know, there's, where there's so much opportunity theoretically out there. Where do I start? How do I start to evaluate it? It's a big question. Oh, absolutely. Well, there's, um, kind of my, my lead into why I asked that question is because yesterday, um, again, fantastic reports of, you said earlier, marketplace polls comes up with such great and amazing, um, information, um, obviously data. I always tell people follow data in terms of what that looks like. Uh, what I wanted to uh, share for the screen, there it is. That's why I didn't want to do it right in the midst of talking and freak out everyone. Um, this this graph very simplistic in nature, but what they kind of what they alluded to was again uh, giving credit to Marketplace Pulse for putting this on um, the Amazon the top ten U.S. e-commerce retailers. Again, looking at marketplaces in general, uh, Amazon third party marketplaces came in a total of 25% of market share of all e-commerce in 20, uh, as of right now, of when they took that data set. Uh, obviously, Amazon Retail goes into there, but those other marketplaces, like you mentioned a little bit earlier, Wayfair, you talked about Target, Home Depot, so on and so forth. Is this surprising? Is this uh, not surprising in terms of the U.S. market? And then my kind of other question for you, Dave, is what's the one we all need to kind of keep our eye on in the u.s marketplace is it is it is it wayfair is it you know walmart like everyone wants to talk about what, what are those indications from you and your team of hey this is one that you really want to grow in a marketplace this is the opportunity whether it be u.s or internationally yeah yeah it's it's good questions I, I don't when I look at this, it doesn't it doesn't really surprise me um, right. that much. Obviously, when you when you with with Apple, um, you know, being being specific, uh, direct <laughs> those darn app stores. Not so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then there's there's obviously niches, right? There's, you know, the Home Depot is never going to sell, you know, or at least I don't think they're going to sell iPads. They're not going to sell clothing. They're not going to sell clothing. They're not going to sell but, protein bars, at least not a lot of that kind of thing. But here, here, here's the thing, too. I will, I will take a quick a quick side note onto that. You say never. This is the kind of the surprising thing, too. Um, he was also announced our, the plans were for a Lowe's uh, to invite or have, I, I would want to say it's PetSmart or uh, some sort of, I think it was Pet of Foods and have some sort of stand in in their marketplaces in some of their retail stores as well. So this cross collaboration of retail versus retail, but we're also talking not necessarily e-com, but we're talking cross retail collaboration. Does that make sense? So you say maybe it's never I'm going to see Kohl's selling uh, a lawnmower or something like that, or like a, I'm trying to think of a Home Depot selling clothing. Probably not, but there is a little bit of a collaboration approach in their opportunity. So that's a side note I wanted to bring. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they, you know, from, from a couple of different lanes, you know, that's exciting in terms of the opportunity to sort of cross promote products. You know, through Get your market. fertilizer and your dog food all in one place. Right. Exactly. And, you know, as they, as these, these, um, let's call them just these, these sites offer more opportunities uh, for promotion of products, you know, what, what type of opportunities does that offer a brand, especially like you mentioned, where there's, uh, where, where, where Home Depot is, you know, selling clothing beyond just, uh, you know, kind of construction, if you will, type, uh, you know, work, work clothing, if you will. Um, so it'll be interesting. I would say, though, answering your second question, 
the the one that I hear the most uh, general interest about and and sort of uh, murmurings and and um, seems to come up the most often in conversations. I think people are beyond they've sort of accepted that for the most part, you know, you should be on Walmart, right? Like it's, we've been talking about Walmart for years now and how quickly or if, or when they're going to catch up with Amazon and what that looks like. The one that comes up though is, is target, you know, and target plus that one seems to come up so often in conversations. And uh, obviously they're even, you know, a little bit further behind, you know, Walmart in terms of maturity of, of, of setting up target as a marketplace. But I think that target has that uh, obviously from a brick and mortar, um, uh, sort of set up, you know, na- nationwide, probably, you know, be beyond North America, uh, potentially there's, there's just, th- there's some brand equity, uh, f- with target, you know, as a brand itself and the types of products that it carries, even outside the U S that's a good question. I'm not hundred percent sure exactly what their footprint is outside of the U S but definitely mm-hmm. in the U S uh, for sure. And that was, that's the one that, um, most people are, are, are kind of trying to crack into is, is target. And, you know, from, from our lane, even, you know, we have, we have, we have some conversations, some contacts within target. Um, they're, they're obviously being very selective in terms of the types of brands that are, that they're allowing to, you know, to, to set up and sell. If you already have brick and mortar uh, distribution through target, it's, it's a lot easier. If you're a new brand coming to target and you're exclusively looking at you know, target.com, it can, the, the barriers to entry can be a little bit higher, but uh, that, that would be the one, I guess I would say in terms of just, it comes up most often and is yet still pretty small, but, uh, but I think that'll be changing in the next you know, handful of years. Yeah. There, um, we talked with, uh, the team over at pack view a little bit, um, just in the nature of what that looks like. And, uh, if you're not familiar and just kind of Jack everyone's memory, uh, they were actually acquired by a helium 10, uh, recently they collaborated in that approach, but more of the marketplace, um, advertising aspect. So third-party advertising a little bit easier to get into, but more of a, the selling aspect of um, trying to figure out, like you were mentioning, hasn't been opened up by Target. And that, that's what I took away from that. I think it was anywhere from 300 to 500 sellers that were actively allowed to sell in the marketplace for Target specifically. But there is this notion, I th- even I'll, I'm going to credit Marketplace Pulse again, because they they really compact data down into actionable by says insights. Um, that has been trying to go on for three years and so so what i guess kind of to to lean into this dave what's leading you into the notion that they're going to open it up even more than just maybe 500 people or 500 sellers i I would say to more of a marketplace or a bus nature of which walmart's certainly definitely trying to lean into amazon is the cream of the crop what is what are those indications to say hey seller maybe this is an opportunity and you should put this on a roadmap for 2022, 2023. Yeah. Well, again, it's, if you have, if you, if you already have a target buyer or if you have some type of a relationship with target uh, already, I think that that's sort of its own kind of, kind of different animal, um, probably a little bit easier in terms of, of getting products also. More listed. of a one P approach. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you already have something there. If you're if you're just looking at Target exclusively from an e-commerce or an e-commerce first perspective, you know, a lot of brands we speak with are like, you know, hey, we're growing very quickly. We'd love to get on, I don't know, let's say Walmart.com or Walmart Marketplace. But also long term, our plans are we'd love to get in touch with somebody at Walmart because we'd also like to get products on shelves. Yeah. Um, Retail is king. Exactly. Is that a is that a is that also like at the forefront for for everyone that you talk to with you guys are talking was such a, such an amazing spread of brands. Like, uh, was it Condé Nast and, and, and kind of those amazing, I, I'm not looking at, I'm not trying to cheat. It's just off the top of my head here. Um, so I'm not looking at a, a website or anyone who's, uh, listening to this. Uh, but then the brands are amazing. Like JBL, which have brand equity. Right. And if you go back to why should they be looking at e-commerce again, retail in the, in the terms of retail landscape, of 100% of the pie, e-commerce only equates to 15% of, of sales across all retail channels. So it is important to have a presence in shelving on shelves where commerce's majority is still happening. So how does that, is that relationship you guys also kind of manage of both retail to e-commerce, but e-commerce to retail? Is that is that something of a big focus as well? Yeah, I think so. I would say it's current state still, it's a little bit more reactive. Like for example, buyers at, at these, at like a Walmart at a target right there, they're, they're really leveraging, especially for new, uh, high growth up and coming brands. <clears throat> they're leveraging 
e-commerce or basically you know sales through their marketplace as a way to as a proof of concept for whether this brand potentially could be successful on the shelves as well so to the extent that the brand um can work well, you know, with uh, with whomever you know their point of contact is for these marketplaces, or just or just um, support and really build out their their presence, you know, uh, support that with uh, with promotional with advertising dollars, right, and really get traction. I think it's long term. It's going to be you know that that sort of proof of concept model to whether it makes sense to also launch brick and mortar shelves is is going to continue to uh, to trend heavier in that direction, and the brands that are ready to to support and invest into even just the the marketplace side of things are probably the ones that are going to sort of emerge at the top uh, top of the list of of brands that uh that these large retailers are looking to bring into brick and mortar as well um so i think that that's that's going to continue to be the case in terms of uh target specifically you know i think that this is my opinion more than anything but i think you know target even walmart to some extent has they've looked at some of the um yeah i guess let's call them pitfalls or sort of shortcomings of of maybe the amazon 3p model of just kind of laying it all out there you know especially in the early days of 3p of of kind of figuring it out like let's just get as many sellers as we can you know we'll send buyers out to these shows we'll get tons of uh of brands into the platform in different ways whether it's 1p 3p um and then we'll figure it out as we go along i think what you're seeing is a little bit more conservative of like hey let's not let's not have some of the issues, right? And we know what the issues are because you can turn on the news and you can, uh, you can, you can see kind of what, what, uh, what comes front and center for, for most marketplace related news. Let's make sure we're not making some of those mistakes. So more of like a, uh, not necessarily thoughtful, but more of a, like a methodical kind of, uh, growth approach to their marketplace offering. And therefore the number of sellers and the types of sellers and the categories of products and everything that they're, that they're willing to open up as they go along. So, I think that it's just a different approach, right? Instead of casting the net wide and just letting, for the most part, anybody come in and sell um, like you can with a, with an eBay or with an Amazon, um, it's a little bit more of like, let's be choosy, let's pick the, the brands and let's, let's be a little bit more methodical in terms of that growth path for uh, the numbers and the types of sellers in our platform. Yeah, that makes complete business sense to me. I think there's... Um... There, there's an approach which, again, you don't throw everything into every basket. Like, is, uh, I, I think this is another conversation that people continuously, uh, let's call it fact and fiction or call it myth busting or whatever we want to call it, of if I'm a seller and they look at, oh, I want to sell in Japan. Japan's a great marketplace, probably third on Amazon, has Rakuten, has billion plus people that are actively having e-commerce, mobile shopping, cross-border um, you know, you name it, it, ha it checks off every top five box there, but the notion that, which if they have a catalog of like, you are probably working with, uh, brands who have like 5,000 SKUs, 30,000 SKUs, hundred thousand SKUs, something along those nature, which are a big brand. Yep. And they're going to look at it and say, I do, I cannot replicate such quantity and put it into a different marketplace that is unsustainable. And I, I can't. I can't just double the nature of my investment into product inventory, anything like that. What I always tell people is like, listen, you, you, you percentage, you, you, you half step it, if you will. That's a famous phrase I like to use half step it into it of call it 10% of your, your volume of what you're doing into. And again, that, that math is depending on each brand of doesn't have to be tit for tat. Japan doesn't have to equate what you're doing in the United States or in Canada or anything like that. But what it can do is it can lift, 3% it can lift 5% it can lift all these percentages and as you stack marketplaces and countries on top of each other holy cow the math works out so that you just you equate what you're doing internationally what you are potentially in the United States or not so is that is that another conversation that you like to have with in terms of like category selection and inventory planning and all that kind of forecasting if you will of you don't have to double it you just have to be choosy about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, e even if you look at um, Amazon.com for, let's say, a brand that that's you know uh, achieved some level of maturity um, selling through Amazon.com. In my experience, you know, looking at hundreds of brands over the years, typically ten percent or even less of the total SKU count makes up ninety percent or greater of the overall sales. 
oftentimes, hopefully, you're also in an advantageous inventory position on those best selling products as well. And, and obviously that, you know, we start to talk a little bit about logistics, supply chain disruption, right? Containers. And that's a different episode. All that thing, right. You know, exactly. Right. Like, so you can't simply just make that decision like, hey, this is my best seller here. So therefore it will be my best seller over there. Right. There's other you know factors to consider as well. But just but just simply calling it out from a what products are most likely to get traction the fastest in a marketplace, right? Look at those top selling products, you know, that that's, that's really going to be your bread and butter, right? You're going to start with a, you know, those products or maybe even a subset of those top selling products where you have, again, plenty of inventory, you have, uh, you know, maybe you know, in certain instances, you, you have to um, like weights and measurements and different things, mm -hmm. you know, are different country to country. You know, if you get into food, obviously you get into regulatory. Um, yeah. We talked about yesterday, uh, uh, yeah. New Zealand or into Germany market, um, a New Zealand branded uh, honey, which again is a, it is technically produced by an insect German. I think we're talking about Germany. German laws have different uh, regulations if it's produced by animal versus you know, insect or anything of the sort. And all of a sudden it has to be like stored differently. It has to be packaged differently. It has to be sealed and then boxed and sealed again or something along those lines where you don't think about it in the United States. You're like, yeah, I mean, seal it and it ships or those different regulations. Yeah. That, that, that can certainly become tricky. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. A good, a good friend of mine uh, worked at a, a company um, and that that makes uh, dairy free protein bars. And uh, one of the ingredients in their protein bars is monk fruit and monk fruit is not a permitted uh, food ingredient. Ask me what, I, what is monk fruit? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't either. It's something that goes into this particular protein bar brand or at least think that the monks grow in their backyard <laughs> in their monastery, something like that. Right. I was just seeing something at like Costco literally yesterday. It was like a monk fruit, like, like it was right on the package, like monk fruit. So uh, I, All right. I'll learn more. But anyway, question was, for the audience. If you know what a monk fruit is, and if you can send it to us without Googling it, you okay. win the award for the day. Absolutely. Send it our way. Where does it come from? I'm curious, actually. We need to need to find out. <laughs> but anyway, so monk fruit's not permitted in food by the EU, um, and so to get that to change, somebody's going to make a have to make a large investment to 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 get that particular ingredient uh, permitted in food. And so um, for them, you know, the the EU sort of becomes a market that they, you know, it's it's either make a huge investment or maybe wait for another large CPG food company to make that investment and then kind of coattail on that. So Germany may be a huge opportunity for their market based on the, the type of, of customer that's looking for, you know, dairy free protein bars. Uh, however, there's some hurdles to get there. Right. So then kind of where do you start to look um, when, when you have those kind, kind of headwinds? And that's the, the questions uh, a lot of people are asking. But going back to where I started, generally speaking, you know, the best sellers, right? That's, that's the, that's the catalog. There's a reason those products are the best sellers. And let's make sure that um, when you're, when you're, when you're listing or uh, making those products available in a, in a global or a, let's say a marketplace outside of your, your home region that uh, weights dimensions, you know, kind of, the, you know, you're from a regulatory standpoint and from a, of uh, how, how people evaluate the product standpoint that you're, you're in line with that particular region and any products you have that may be, are somewhat ambiguous around that right they just kind of apply like you can drop them in anywhere and for the most part maybe with some tiny packaging changes or something like that um, they're easy to de deploy in those marketplaces i mean that's that's going to be your best place to start testing a product right and hopefully those are also your best sellers absolutely what, what's a what's a surprising mistake that you see a lot of brands make um to you maybe as an individual or as a company it, it's more of like a case study in you, you see a lot more people start to trend that way, whether it be their fault or just maybe it's a silly thing that it might be listed in a marketplace in their terms. And a lot of people are making mistakes. What's that thing that's kind of shocked you with working with Memento or in your past history in that regards? Yeah, we see, you know, I'd say like broadly speaking, the, um, the largest one we see is, 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 de is deploying inventory. We're putting effort into launching a marketplace where there that hasn't really been properly vetted. Um, the demand hasn't been properly assessed. Uh, the the cost of doing business or just landed cost of getting product into that country from a taxes, fees, you know, distribution perspective, what you're able to actually sell the product for uh, at the end of the day, and, and and whether it's margin positive, right? Like we we see we see some groups just launching product and uh, and then trying to kind of figure everything else out later. 
And, you know, with, with as many marketplaces are, are out there and as many as much opportunity that exists for most brands globally, um, it's, it's a big mistake. And, and I'd say most brands you know, should not be making that mistake, probably can't afford to make that type of mistake. So uh, finding the right people, finding the right partners, uh, vetting the product, making sure you understand duties, taxes, you know, business, legal cost structures, right? Everything that it's going to take to get product into the into country, into that where into that marketplace and available for sale. Um, you know, it's it's important. I mean, we sometimes, uh, you know, in our lane kind of breeze by some of those things and not intentionally, not because they're not important, but because of kind of where we focus in terms of helping our, our clients. But you really need to make sure you're spending due diligence on that front. And what Mementa often does in terms of how we work with brands is we actually have a very large vetted operating partner network that helps with each aspect of, of both uh, auditing and understanding um, the opportunity and, and frankly, helping to develop a go to market plan. I mean, this this is um, this is a pretty, pretty large undertaking and it's hard for even one group, unless that's all you focus on is just taking brands international um, to really wrap their heads around. So. What we do is for brands that are, especially brands that are looking to expand globally, right? They don't have anything happening in these global marketplaces yet is um, we'll expose them to, to our operating partners that can help with, with each step of that process for making sure that they launch, they launch right and they launch with a high probability of success. Sorry, I'm typing out. I was I was putting something in the comment section to point people to Momenta. So you caught me in. <laughs> you caught me in when typing. Uh, well, so for stuff like that, um, you know, with international growth and and just kind of that that notion, is that something that through, like through the software and and an understanding, hey, I'm going to be able to know like the fees and the calculations, almost like a profit loss statement of this is what I'm landing cost. If I know A, B, C, I can get to X, Y, Z in each marketplace. Is that something that kind of helps self-calculate or the team can help me evaluate all those notions? Because again, each country, each marketplace, we talked about it, it has different fees, has different uh, landed costs. Where do you store the inventory? Is that what Memento can help with in that regards? Yeah, it's a good question. So actually, I would say that today the answer is, is, is no. It, today, our, our software is a little bit less focused on vetting uh, opportunity and a little bit more focused on once vetting is completed, how do we make sure that, again, we have control and management of catalog inventory, pricing, shipping messaging data, inventory data, um, and, and we're able to not only control but also report on those, those metrics. Mm. Getting to that point, um, is, is something that, you know, we, 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 we help our clients do it. Um, like I said earlier, we help, we help with a combination of what we know in house and having done this, you know, from a, from a, from a sort of a, a team perspective, several decades, um, but within Mementa's lifetime about the last six years. Um, and we go through this, this process where we're, we're looking again, what's the, what's the inventory position, right? What's, uh, what do we have that's happening in that country? Are there listings there? Like, what's the um, what, what price are they selling products at? What are, what would be our land costs, including all fees, taxes, et cetera, to get to get products in country? Uh, what what inventory deployment options are out there and available? So so kind of going through that process is uh, still somewhat manual today. Uh, we also use some of those same tools we talked about earlier for marketplace intelligence in terms of getting um, demand estimates, revenue, unit sell through you know, review quantity, quality, like all of those types of things, competitor overview. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, frankly, if there's somebody listening, that's, that's looking to, uh, to build a business model, that's, that's a good one. Uh, that the, uh, we, we may be a customer in the end. There you go. Well, I mean, we come up with so many good ideas on this show. I wish someone would just take them and run and, and give us a little bit of that percentage of, of what is it? The, the royalty fees or whatnot. But, uh, I mean, that, that that's fascinating because, Again, you have to start thinking globally. I think that's where e-commerce really gets exciting for for businesses and entrepreneurs is is that next step, or even brands in general. Of it could be it could be a well known Fortune five hundred company in in every single grocery store or retail store, and yet somehow they might be missing the component of e-commerce, the fastest growing notion of I want my goods in the other side of the world. How does that effectively? How do I effectively get that in the household quicker, more effectively? um in, in collaboration in that regards and again it's funny to see people could work backwards like an amazon doing amazon style recently where you can literally sh they announce that you can shop if you're in glendale california you can go here soon uh and you're listening to this uh you can go to their store look at one dress shop via 
their uh, their uh, in their dressing room on their on their panel and uh, their smart device, and you can it'll be delivered to that dressing room, whether it be that warehouse or the footprint's not terribly big. It's like the size of a TJ Maxx, if you will, and um, it, it's there in the dressing room, just waiting for you. Um, that be third party, that could be a large brand, and the notion of just which the different directions, and then as you retail to online, online to retail, and then you throw that internationally, then all bets are off. And it's kind of a crazy notion in that regards. Um, Dave, in the last like couple of minutes I have with you here, what what's what's 2022 look like for a moment? What, what's like that we have these three goals or uh, two goals? What are, what are we trying to like achieve here, kicking off here in 2022 and, and really making our footprint known? Yeah, absolutely. So so there's there's several um, priorities, right? At at the end of the day, we're a technology company, so we continue to look at uh, different ways of of how can we standardize and, and frankly just build more inter- integration connections. I mean, oftentimes Momentus sits between um, a brand's marketplace presence and then whatever warehouse management system or ERP system or both, you know, that they're using uh, to manage inventory, whether it's their own or it's a maybe a distributor or a wholesaler in that country, right? And kind of becoming that unified, like I said earlier, connective tissue between those. Um, so from a technology standpoint, we continue to look at new marketplaces. Oftentimes that's dictated by our existing client base and which marketplaces they're interested in getting into next. And that's kind of how we prioritize uh, which, which marketplaces we're adding to our network. Um, but but obviously when we when we when we have brands that are interested in potentially working with Momenta, they have a maybe a one off here and there of different types of marketplaces they're seeking as well. We, we prioritize those things. Um, and from a from a people standpoint, you know, our team's continuing to grow. We're, we're a venture backed group. Um, so uh, that's been that's been very supportive you know, from from our investors, from our board and, and continuing to grow the team. Um, and then from a, from a process standpoint, you know, we continue to bring in people that, that can help us standardize some of these things. So as we start to look um, globally, and we, 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 um, as you mentioned earlier, just that process of how do you figure out and how do you actually execute getting into a marketplace um, where we have sort of concentrations of clients within a country, let's say, I'll use Japan as an example. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, of groups recently that have just uh, had a lot of focus on Japan as part of their global growth strategy. Absolutely. So, so, so us going deeper into Japan, right? Knowing more, I guess, being able to uh, sort of articulate, understand, and go deeper in terms of the process to launch Yahoo Shopping in Japan, Amazon, Rakuten, you know, PayPay, Mall, all these different places, right? Um, there, there's enough. There's, there's a lot of like intellectual sort of knowledge that you just you gain uh, within the teams and you can build process around as you really understand everything at a very finite detail within each of mar- each of these marketplaces within each of these regions. So for us, you know, our, our strategy is is going to be to continue to sort of go go where the interest is. And, and we have a couple of those regional pockets throughout the world where obviously, you know, Europe is obviously huge right now. It gets if you start talking about just growth opportunities outside the US, Typically, Europe is, if not the first, it's maybe the second um, on the list. But we're going to continue to to just build those detailed integrations and really help our clients move through that process much faster uh, to launch their products within each of these marketplaces. That's amazing. Well, yeah, I, I've been so impressed, and obviously, um, the co- the company is growing fast. I come from software. I, I understand. Like this is more in de- Like I think it's more in, in in depth. I would call it. This is an in depth look at how to elevate your opportunities like you said medium to more enterprise level brand which a lot of people are trying to do figure out that next step there's so much opportunity in the world i i continuously say yes the us is we spent a lot of money here let's be frank um and i joke about that but it's true we have a lot of spending power but as you start to categorize like you said these pockets of the world call it gmvs you call it apac you call it um europe you look at you know, just uh, in, in general, Mediterranean, like South, uh, Latinx, uh, you were talking about um, such amazing, crazy opportunity, all different in how you have to build the playbook in order to in to order to execute it. Just because the infrastructure, the language, marketing, the localization, everything we talked about today and on previous shows, it, it all has to work together. And that and that's kind of the amazing thing as technologies like you guys are, are piecing it all together. It's not it's not one size fits all, but it's a it's a as close as you can probably get it. So, um, after I after I buttered you up right there, David, if uh, <laughs> Dave, David, what are you, uh, if people want to 
connect with you if they want to learn more. Obviously, it's such a robust and cool ecosystem that you guys have built out there. How do people get in touch with you or learn more about Momenta? What's that best way? Yeah, absolutely. So reach out on LinkedIn. Um, my uh, email is fine too. My, my email is just dave.vanerjet at momenta.com. So first name, last name uh, at momenta.com. Um, through our social platforms, you know, we're, we're happy to engage however and, and whenever works. Um, you know, we love, we love talking about this stuff. You know, we, we kind of live and breathe it every day. Uh, we enjoy whether it's, whether it's a fit for you or whether you're just looking to understand a little bit more about when to think about global marketplaces or how to evaluate them or how it would fit into your, your sort of larger go to market strategy. Um, you know, we, we love to riff on this stuff all the time. So get in touch with us. If there's anything we can do to add value, provide some perspective, uh, talk about maybe somehow of, of, of how our clients have been successful launching marketplaces that you're interested in um, or anything that touches just global marketplace expansion. Um, let us know. We're, we're happy to talk. And if we if we don't know the answer, we're happy to point you in the direction of somebody that that can. Like I said, we've built a pretty large operating partner uh, ecosystem over over the six uh, going on seven years that momentum has been around. So uh, we'll, we'll get you in the right hands um, either way. That's amazing. Well, yeah, you guys surprisingly been around a little. I would call that a decently long time, but that ecosystem we built on really, really taking off here. So um, thanks again for just sharing some of the insights and, and whatnot. And I always tell people once they get it through the gauntlet with me and now become a friend of the show. So more than happy to have you on again, riff on opportunities internationally, um, you know, through here in the marketplaces or just any kind of notions that you guys are in uncovering and what you would like to educate our market you're more than welcome to come back on. So thank you so much for just some of the time that you got to spend here in my corner of the internet. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. Appreciate yeah. it. No problem. Thank you, Dave. And then, again, thank you everyone else for coming on Crossover Commerce episode 213. We're making our, we're making our sweet way through this, uh, <laughs> through, through the week. Uh, here it's Wednesday, February 2nd. So we have one more episode coming this week. Really cool opportunity. I'm, I'm going to have a, not just a one-on-one, -on -one, which I'm typically known for, but we're going to be talking with the co-founder and head of marketing over at Suma Brands here, located here in the United States, um, another uh, aggregator brand acquirer, if you will. We're going to be talking with them about how their approach to branding marketing and omni-channel approach functions in terms of when they take over a brand, put the blood, sweat, and tears into an opportunity. We're going to fast forward that into what it takes to replicate that and how to help it grow on their end. So I'm really excited to have a, uh, a big, uh, one, one on two discussion with him this Friday. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you follow us on social media, on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, or you can follow myself to search for Ryan Kramer, um, search for ping pong payments, any of those ways to be notified of future episodes when we go live and when audio episodes come out as well. Thank you, Dave Vanderjat of Mementa for coming out today and sharing some insights and wisdom, uh, from Mementa and him, uh, in his experience in the past, but until next time, or until then, we'll catch you guys next time on another episode of Crossover Commerce. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.